I'm here with uh, Marina Endicott, and uh, we're going to be talking about writing today. Um, so you've written, um, what is it, four books to date? I think uh, so, yeah. Well, you published four books. I lose count. Uh, four books. I've just about finished another one. Okay. Uh, which, which one's that? It's called Utopia, and it'll be coming out in the fall of 2014. Nice. What's it, uh, what's it about? Oh, I hate uh, that question. Can you, no, uh, a new book. It's it, well, it's just because I always sound so stupid. It's not like I'm superstitious or anything, but it's um, it's about a lonely and unhappy man whose mother is dying and who is surrounded by death and rain and floods and horror. And uh, but he thinks he could maybe help some of his friends. <laughs> so he's trying to fix everybody else's life because uh, his own, his own is hopeless. That sounds interesting. Mm. It's, uh, it's, it's never particularly the situation, but more how the character evolves and makes it interesting. I hope so. Well, I mean, I've, I've read your other work. I, I'm sure it will be. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Okay, um, so when did you start out writing? I didn't start out writing. I started out in theater. And so I, as an actor in theater, and then later as a director, I wrote reams and reams of stuff on character uh, research. Um, I wrote plays, um, so I was always writing. But I was, but I was mainly working in theater. But then I, in order to to maintain my life in theater, from time to time, I'd have to go work in offices. And while I was working in offices, I would, uh, in order to look busy, I couldn't read, but I could start writing. So I wrote short stories while I was working in offices because you know you could be typing away on something that looked as if you were working, but really I was. I was just creating stories. Um, started with short stories mainly because I felt like I could finish one, and because the it seemed to me that the world that you're creating in a short story is is encompassable within the three or four hours at a time that I would have to think about it because I was distracted and moving from job to job. Uh, but I was very happy to move into writing. Well, my stories just kept getting longer and longer. So <laughs> they had to start calling them novels. Is that, is that how you kind of transitioned to novels? Just kept writing short stories? <laughs> By being really bad at short stories, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you got enough to say. You want to keep going, right? Uh, well, the thing is, once you've created them, and even though the short story world is perhaps, the borders are a little bit uh, narrower, it is still, you're still creating that whole world. And once you've done that, then you get to know them and you want to hang out with them for longer. So, so every time I would write a short story, it would basically turn into a novel. Okay. <laughs> well, I, yeah, that makes sense. Um, what about, how did you approach characters, like new characters? Well, because I had worked as an actor for so long, most of my work had been on character. I'd, I'd been thinking about um, how to how to really analyze and deepen an understanding of a character all my life. So this, the work that I do as a writer on character, I think is grounded pretty, um, pretty thoroughly in my acting work and in, in the work of the imagination of, um, of, you know, first imagining and then filling out and fleshing out and deepening and pushing at a person until they become human to you. Okay. Um, how about, how about, uh, <laughs> how, did, how does uh, being an author influence where you live? Like, it I, I, seems like a very mobile career, but are there any locations that are particularly good to like go meet publishers or, or work on, on, on pieces? That's actually a really sensible question. But it's got several different answers. One of the things, that some writers find is that where they live influences where they, how they work so deeply that it's really important for them to live in place. So people like Fred Stenson, who writes about the prairie landscape and the history of, of this place so passionately and from such a deep knowledge, I think he would find it really arid to go live in Toronto. Um, I think that he gets such sustenance from the landscape around him and, and really for him, that story does arise from place. So for some people that's the case. Uh, you could name lots of others. Sharon Butala, who just got a, an honorary doctorate at the University of Alberta this year. Her work really began, um, seriously began, when she moved to a ranch outside East End. And there are lots of people we could think of who are urban writers who, 
who get their energy and their, their source of story comes from the surroundings that they live in. It's not really the case for me. I'm, I'm usually thinking back 20 years in my writing and I'm usually, I'm such a slow thinker that it takes me a long time, a long distance maybe is better, a better way to put it, a long distance to think about, to figure out what what I was even thinking in those days, you know. So where I live at the present is only going to be working, I'm only going to be working on that in 20 years from now, so it doesn't <laughs> matter. Edmonton, I'm not going to be thinking about you for a long time. Uh, the, so the, that's one aspect of it is that where you live, of course, will infest, infect how you write. But the other important practical point is that if you want to be in the heart of publishing, it, you're going to have to be in Toronto, at least some of the time. So I think a lot of the Western writers that I know, and I'm sure this holds true for the other coast as well, engineer things so that you have periods of time where you're stuck in Toronto. <laughs> stuck, I mean, when you're <laughs> fortunate enough to be in Toronto. <laughs> it's easy for me because my family's there, so I can go and stay with my parents. And, and that's, of course, being dutiful, a, a good daughter, too. I think that there's no way around it, though. It's the same in the States, that you have to be in New York. It's the same in England, you have to be in London. There, you, you do need to be visible. You know, they have short memories, publishers and book people, because their, their world is so cyclical. Everything is coming up the next season, the next season after that, that it's very easy to get dropped out of out of the loop if you're not just reminding them of your presence from time to time. So I think that for somebody starting out, if you can choose where you're going to live and you don't care if, you're, if your landscape isn't, as far as you're aware, a great source of work for you, then you might as well go to Toronto and just face up to it. Do you think uh, digital networking has changed that at all? Yes, but not enough. It's certainly better because we are in closer communication with each other. I mean, if you're talking about email, if you're talking about Skyping and you know video conference calls, not at all. That, I don't, I'm not aware of any publishers who actually use those, those tools. We email each other all the time. And then we do in-person visits, which are usually distinguished with a lovely meal. <laughs> I thought that was just a myth, but it turns out it's true. Publishers take you out for lunch, <laughs> and they take you for drinks, and in the evening they take you for supper. It's lovely. Uh, uh, that's something to look forward to. It is. <laughs> look forward to that, because it's one of the very few benefits you're ever going to get. <laughs> um, how did you first get published? Like, How did you get in, uh, in touch with a publisher? Well, this is also... Still extremely good advice for anybody starting out. Um, the advice that I was given when I was still working in theatre and I had a couple of stories finished, I didn't even know what to do with them. And um, one of my, um, one of a, a friend of a friend who, who was a writer said, well, you should go and see the writer in residence at the library. I was living in Saskatoon then and their writer in residence has been the... Um, I think they've been going for 40 years. It's a wonderful program. So I went there and I saw the writer in residence, uh, Gertrude Story, and she said, this story is great, send it out right away, which I was very surprised to hear. So she, and I didn't know where to send it, but she told me to send it to one of the literary magazines in that there's a network of them all across Canada. So I sent it to Green Magazine and it got published. I thought that was just how everything would go from then on. <laughs> I was a bit distressed the next time I sent something out when I didn't get it published right away. But I think it's still one of the very useful ways for young writers to get started is to just to go read those magazines. Grain Magazine's a great one still, the Malahat, Prism. Um, Brick Magazine's fantastic, the Fiddlehead, uh, Antigonish Review, I could go on and on. Any, you can find them on a Google search. Uh, but all those literary magazines are, they're not just a great place to be published, but they're a great place to see what, what work is being done right now and what people are thinking about the art of fiction, the art of poetry. And once you get published in a couple of those, then you have something to put in your letter when you send the manuscript to a big publisher to say, well, I've had a story in Grain and I was shortlisted for the Journey Prize for this story in Malhat, so maybe you'll read my manuscript, and they will. <laughs> 
sounds that sounds good. How how do you think you would like a choose a, a particular magazine to get published in, like like to to apply to? Oh, go read them and see what you like. And if you can't afford to buy them, which of course I'm sure nobody can because they're quite expensive, go stand in chapters and take advantage of their reading policy and have a look through them. Um, they, most libraries will have a really wide selection and the librarian will help you pick them out or again you can just search for them. Many of them have a lot of online uh, material now. Uh, Brick for example, mm, <clears throat> I think Grey Magazine has quite a few stories from their archives online. So really pick one that you like, that the writing in it speaks to you in some way because then that's likely they're more likely to take you. That makes sense. Um, so I was watching Murder, She Wrote the other night, and uh, <laughs> and uh, there's a, there was this one young lady running around at this uh, this um, award ceremony they were having for writers, and she was shoving her manuscript in, in the faces of publishers. I'm assuming that's not how you want to do it. <laughs> how would you go about approaching a publisher? Oh, don't do that. <laughs> the poor publishers, you just have to remember that their lives are one long continuous nightmare of a teetering pile of 700 page manuscripts that you know really they're the hardest audience you'll ever have any reader who buys a book on in a bookstore is going to be much more willing to read your book than a publisher is because they just are so burned out so tired of the endless stream of, of new fiction they have to read how do you how do you approach them just like email or well there's a standard pr procedure of sending a proposal which usually includes a one-page synopsis of your, we'll just say it's a novel, one-page synopsis of your novel, no more than that, don't go over a page because they can't read it, they don't have time. And then a sample chapter, maybe 30 to 50 pages, probably 30 is better than 50, and a nice little letter at the front that says, here I am, uh, my name's and I have had a story in Grey Magazine and I was shortlisted for the Journey Prize, would you be interested <laughs> in reading my manuscript? Now, you can still send your manuscript in when you don't have a single credit, but then your letter might better be really good, and your your synopsis page had better be, yeah, like, don't make it just a bald recitation of the plot, but allow that synopsis page to have something of the character of the book in it, and something of the excitement of the book. Give it a little bit of texture. I see. All right. But you might want it also not apply to every, not send the manuscript to every single publisher find out who's most likely to publish your stuff by looking at their stuff by seeing oh i see that cormorant press is publishing a lot of up and coming young men who have interesting ways with language and they're doing strange things with form i think maybe that's a better home for me than kato books which is mostly doing kind of prairie stories based in landscape and i'm not that interested in that so you know a, a little bit of analysis will help um, so, oh, sorry, I, um, I, I wrote notes and then, I know, I'm, I'm super professional, guys, don't even worry about this, but uh, I wrote notes and I'm having trouble reading my own writing. Wikipedia quotes you as saying, I write novels instead of plays because I like the intimate link of the silent writer and the silent reader. Absolutely love that quote. Is that actually a quote? That is actually a quote, yeah. Um, I can't remember where it's from. But it's true, I did say that. I do like, I do, I stand by it, I really do. I got awfully tired in working in theater of, well, of the thing that I now miss, now that I don't work in theater, of the instant feedback, of the, the crowd, the crowdness of it, that there's something ephemeral happening that's going on right this minute that can be so magnificent, maybe the best of all the arts, in my opinion. However, that's when it works and it only works a quarter of one percent of the time so you have these outstanding nights of theater where you think i'm i'm part of the best thing that humans have ever done about three times in your life whereas <laughs> with fiction you can get it you can make it better you can make it perfect you can make it so that that transcendent moment is actually on a page and readable not just next week, but in 50 years or 200 years, it'll still be there, still waiting to be cracked open. And again, it will be, as it is today, a silent person in one room scribbling and a silent person in another room opening and reading. And I love that. 
that tenuous, really strong connection that the writer and the reader have. And so do you think it's, uh, how do you think the, like, the format of the book enables it? Is, it? is it the fact that there's a certain permanency to it that you get to, you know, meld and work with it a little bit longer in form? Again, that's a really good question just because of the changing forms of our readers. Um, I'm not enjoying reading on e-readers. I, I see the sense of it, and I, I'm certainly not against uh, change technology. I mean, I'm, I've, I was a very early adopter of Macs, and I've worked on computers really all my life. Um, I was one of the first people who had a Gmail account. But the e-readers are not yet working for me to create that trance state. So I'm always conscious that I'm involved in the work of reading while I'm reading on an e-reader. No matter how much I really want to read the book, I'm still finding it really a difficult. And res I'm res the process itself is resistant. Um, so I'm still much happier reading on paper. I'm sure that somehow the physiological fact of that will, will be observed and, uh, and analyzed and, and eventually e-readers will be at least as pleasurable to read from as paper is now, I hope. Because it better be, because we're going to be stuck with them. But there was another part to your question, and I've forgotten what it was. Um, something about the permanency of it. Oh, yeah. Well, the making, being able to make it perfect. Well, yeah. I said you could make it perfect, but in fact, of course, you can't. Every time I, it's really hard for me to read books that are already published because I can't make them any better now. And rewriting is such an integral part of the work that I do that I never. I'm never finished. They just have to rip it from my hands as I scream and take it to the publisher. So oh, I could always be better. I don't think, but, but you know, in a novel, you might have two scenes in the novel that you think are really as good as you can make them. And that's good. And then they stay that way. But of course, the things that aren't as good as you can make them stay that way too. So, oh, shit. No, it's <laughs> That's the worst thing about blogging is that I can I can wake up in the middle of the night and turn over to my laptop and edit and it. <laughs> I know because you can always be fixing the blogged one. And then go back to sleep and then wake yeah, up. You know, and then, I okay. can't change it. I said I wouldn't change it. You know, look at the director's cut movies though. I never like them as much as I like the original movie. There is something about the raw and the stuff that had to be done on time that's worth that somehow there's mm, there's something. Um, meatier about that than the over-precious, constantly fiddled, here is my vision kind of one. That makes sense. Oh. So, so quit editing those blogs. All right, I'll stop, I'll stop. But the syntax, the syntax. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, correcting can always be done. Uh, do you feel connected to your reader? I don't, oh. Well, not in any way, the same way that, it, that I used to feel connected to the audience while I was right in the middle of it. And that's one of the reasons I love doing public readings because they're I'm connected to the people in the room very, very concretely. But I feel connected to kind of, to the imaginary reader. I feel very protective of the imaginary reader. I want, I want the work not to be, I don't want to be antagonistic to the reader. You know, I want, I don't, I'm not the kind of writer who wants the reader to do the work. I want to make sure that, um, that we're both working joyfully together as we read, so as they read as I write. Makes sense. Do you feel uh, at all like once removed by the, the story? Because you're using a medium to communicate, right? So you, you, you can't just directly talk to them. You have to like craft a story for them to enjoy. Or, or do you feel just sort of connected by that? I don't know, that's sort of a... That's another really good question. And my answer is that I'm much more connected through fiction than I can connect any other way. If I don't, I mean, if I know people, if I'm intimate friends with people, it may be, it, I I'm may be able to communicate with them better by a letter that is directed from me to them. But when I've tried to work on memoir or anything using the actual bare facts of my own existence, uh, I, it doesn't work for me in prose. It's funny because I think I can tell the truth better through fiction than I can through memoir, through fact. So creative nonfiction has no appeal to me at all because the story is going to be truer than if I just told you exactly what happened. 
because you can't tell everybody exactly what happened. I can't, I can't fill you in on every single thing that went through my head at that moment because I, A, can't remember it, and B, we don't have time. You can't live again my whole life for me. So somehow the act of writing the story and um, condensing the story into a series of impressions that, you, that will act on you the way that real life acted on me seems to work better for me. Makes sense. Um, so now that you're published and, and you've got some success behind you and in front of you, um, do does that change your relationship with publishers? Like, is it easier to, to get in contact with them? Or like, do you have like a hotline in the house somewhere? I'm very, very fortunate in my publisher. I've always been very lucky in publishers, but uh, I'm, I'm probably happiest of all now. I work with Lynn Henry at Doubleday, who I love, and um, so when I have a question or email her, she answers me, yes. But I think the question you're really asking is, um, what about when you haven't had success and you don't feel connected to the publisher? That was the next question, yeah. thank you. And that can be really frustrating and hard. And I don't know any way around that except to reassure you that it's not your fault, that it's just built into the mechanism of the whole industry, that it's hard for writers to broach the fortress. It's hard to get in there. It's hard to stay. It's hard to maintain relationships. It's hard to create relationships in the first place, and then it's hard to keep them going. Um, and the only thing you can do really is keep working as hard as you can. You, I think one of the things that self-publishing blurs is the di difference between writing and selling books. And your job is writing books, and the publisher's job is selling them. In a way, it doesn't matter whether you have a good relationship with the publisher, as long as they put your book out. And it doesn't matter if they have a good relationship with you as long as you work as hard as you can at home alone in a room. You're doing such different jobs that, you know, that nice lunch and that nice dinner is really the only connection you need. As long as you do your work and a beautiful manuscript comes out of it, and they do your book, their work, and a beautiful book comes out of it, they smack together in the middle and there's this beautiful thing. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's tips on getting, like, get a portfolio together, basically, find a chink in that armor and then... Well, yeah, a portfolio meaning get some publication. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's so many venues for publication now, more than there ever have been, that really, if you just keep sending stuff out, you will get published, I promise. And get used to rejection letters. Don't let them... Yeah, I have a hard time with that. I always have a hard time with it. I had, it's probably why I left the theater, because I hated getting rejected. But um, my husband, who's a poet, has a, a file about, oh, I don't know, 100 letters thick. That every time I whined, he would haul out his rejection pile, <laughs> and I'd have to look at them again. Persistence is, is yeah. definitely important. Okay, um, okay, do you have any general advice for aspiring I guess you've given a lot of general advice for aspiring authors. I think I'm going to be too much. Maybe, well, I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's always, you could always use a little bit more. There's a great website run by ProLuke. BeABetterWriter.com. It's uh, Pearl, linked under the video. If this gets up on YouTube. Great. Pearl has Pearl's a great writer, and married to a great poet or partners with a great poet. Um, but her her website has all kinds of uh, links, pieces of advice, reviews of other people's books. Um, it's a really it's something I always steer my students to. One of the things she's got is a, is a fantastic list of contests. So as well as sending into magazines, contests are a really, really good way to break into publishing. And you might make 150 bucks or 1,000 or 3,000. And your chances are a lot better with a contest than they are with sending to a publisher. So send into contests. Cool. Um, do you have any input into the format of your book? I know you're saying that you produce a manuscript and the uh, and the publisher produces the book, um, but do you have any uh, do you have any input into that? Because I was reading um, reading Little Shadows, I believe it is, 
and uh, there's like they're like short sections like before each section there's kind of a tiny little title that gives you an idea of what's going on like a little vaudeville um yeah it's like a little pre-roll or yes, something yes a pre-roll uh, did i have any input into yes. that that's the way that i wrote it um uh i didn't have to fight for that luckily um it, because it pleased my editor because she's wonderful uh, I think there can be times when you may have um, you may have a vision for the format of a book that the publisher is puzzled by or is not quite sure how they will be able to make that manifest. I know Barbara Gowdy, um, when she wrote a book called The White Bone, which is about elephants, she had she wanted to put a CD in the back with the music that she was listening to while she wrote the book, and. She really wanted it, and the publishers at that time just said, that's crazy, we can't do that. But now they could, they would just, you know, do a YouTube, an iTunes playlist, and, and you'd be able to get that playlist really easily now. In fact, I should have done a playlist for The Little Shadows. There is one on my website, but I could have put it in the book. Um, how much input we have into the format of a book probably really depends on how crazy your ideas are, who your publisher is. They do, they uh, flatteringly will send you the possible covers and then you can say, oh, cough, that's ghastly, or I love this more than my firstborn child. But that's about all the input you really have. Okay. Um, so after having spent so much time with your character, with your stories and your characters while writing them, do you read your own books? <laughs> Is it, is it a totally different experience <coughs> than reading someone else's book? I'm assuming so. But. Yeah, well, this is the problem that you can't fix it anymore. I do read my own books to some extent because I, I do a lot of public reading and I love doing that. Um, and uh, when you haven't... I've been working on my latest book, Utopia, for quite a long time now. And last weekend I had to go to Toronto and read from Little Shadows, and it was lovely to go back into it and, and be with the girls again. I missed them. When I was finishing The Little Shadows, my husband came home and found me crying over the keyboard, and he said, what's, what's with you? And I said, um, I can't be with them anymore. It's finished. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, oh, for heaven's sakes, open a new document. And then he dictated the opening of a, of a sequel <laughs> for The Little Shadows. And so I, he said, they're not dead. This is, they go on. <laughs> and that's true. Well, you do become, the, you spend so much time alone while writing and so much time alone with the people you're writing about. And ideally, they become so real that, uh, that it is horrible when you have to lose them. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Uh, okay, the, the, the silly question that always gets asked by everyone forever, where do you get your ideas? Like, inspiration for... <clears throat> I guess people keep asking that question because nobody answers it properly. They come is the only thing that I know how to say. You don't, it's not like I have a set of, um, you know, if I, if I could determine and design what I was going to write, I would probably write murder mysteries. I would write a lot of them. They would be really easy to write and I'd write a series of 54 of them and it would be a big money maker and I would really enjoy it. But I'm no good at those and also that's just not what comes. That's not, um, I guess, ideas are not the same as, uh, ideas in fiction are not the same as ideas in academic work where you spend a lot of time poring over the, your material and then you figure out, analyze and, and figure out what, what you have to say about this material. For fiction, for creative work, it's a different process. It's, it's the, the wellspring bubbles up, throws something at you and you don't really have a choice of what you're going to be working on. It, you're just the combination of experience and image and the various inputs of our all our lives kind of stir around and then every little while there's a geyser and you get a little cup of something mysterious that you're going to have to write about. 
That not that a stupid thing to say? <laughs> it makes sense <laughs> it's all though. I have for you. They come. It's, it's it makes sense though. The same thing. Every time I, I think of a story, it's just you know I've been thinking about something, and then I walk along and I see something else. I'm like that would make a story. You know, I think that that's um, that there's something about connections that maybe is a secret of it that you suddenly think this is like that. Oh, this one thing that I experienced some time ago is like this new thing that I just saw. And now I see, and then there's sort of an electric hum as the machine starts. <laughs> and before you know it, you're forced to spend the next five years writing about some guy in an art gallery, and it floods, and it's raining all the time, and you don't even know why you're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> just some ancient mechanism yeah, into place. The muse has smacked you <laughs> with her rhythm stick. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So, what what kind of skills do you need to be an author? Just like general basic skills. Do you have any tips for improving those? Read, ah. read, 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 read. Read everything. Read old stuff. Read new stuff. Read the best writing you can find, and also read some dreck so that you can see what you want to avoid. Don't be afraid of not reading. Like, don't avoid reading things because you think it might pollute you. Read everything. And when somebody says, I don't want to read too much because I want to maintain the integrity of my own voice, it's like, oh, that's garbage. You won't have a voice if you don't know what the other voices around you are saying. That's how we learn languages, by listening to other people's voices. Um, read a lot. Who cares whether you can spell or not? A spell check will fix it for you, or find a good friend who will go through your manuscript and fix your commas. Think a lot. There's a wonderful book by John Gardner called The Art of Fiction. Even though it's old fashioned, the reason that it keeps coming up and the reason that people return to it is because unlike most writing manuals, he has a little section on faults of soul where he actually dares to say that the writer is responsible for the morality, I don't mean that in a conventional sense, but the set of ideas about good and evil, right and wrong, life and death, love, hate. The writer is responsible for those ideas behind their work, and so you better make sure that yours are good, that yours that you can stand behind what you say. So that's a good book to read. What other skills? You have to be good at being alone. You have to be good at listening. What skills are you developing? Um, well, currently I'm just working on syntax and, and basically trying to communicate exactly what I'm saying. Because I, I know what I'm saying in my head a lot. And I can see these lush expanses and these really cool scenes, but then I go to write them down and there's always something missing from them. And then every once in a while I'll write something and it will it'll come alive when I'm reading it. And I'll look at that and try to figure out exactly what made it do that. Well, you can do that with other people's work as well as your own, but yep. it's good to do both. It's good to write a lot. And I bet you, if you look at what's working, it's because there's life in it when it's working, and probably that means that you're somehow in the space. You're, there's some sensory stuff in it. Yeah. Pretty simple, but it seems to work more than syntax. Yeah, well, my syntax needed a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> well, reading fixes that. Oh, yes, it did. It really, really does. All right, uh, well, thank you very much. Um, I've been Maria Endicott. And go, go check out her new book and her old one because it's quite good. There's, there's four of them. You're too kind.